It is great to have everyone with us today. Uh, we are thrilled to be able to present Arizona Game and Fish and the Petrified Forest STEM resources for STEM teachers, directors, and anyone interested in STEM teaching uh, and learning in the state of Arizona and beyond. And so I welcome today both Eric Proctor from our Arizona Game and Fish organization and also Ranger Emily from our uh, Petrified Forest. And so we're gonna start with Eric and the Game and, Game and Fish, and then we'll move into Emily, uh, Ranger Emily and the Petrified Forest. And we're gonna share all kinds of STEM resources with um, teaching teachers and learners of STEM and STEAM in, in Arizona. For those of you who don't know me or, or know of Arizona Game and Fish, we are the state, uh, wild, the state government agency that's responsible for managing all of Arizona's wildlife. So there's more than 800 species of wildlife that we are responsible for managing across the state of Arizona. A lot of people interact with us through things like hunting and fishing licenses, and that's that's a big part of what we do. But we we don't just manage those species that you can legally take through hunting or fishing. We manage all the species, whether they are um, whether they are um, the hunted ones, uh, the what we would call our non-game species, which are those that you can't legally hunt, and even endangered species, and and those fall into our under our purview as well. Um, we are, even though we're a government agency, we're actually not your typical government agency in that we don't take any taxpayer dollars, any general taxpayer dollars. So there's nothing from your sales tax or your income tax that comes to us. We operate on what we might call like a business model. So it's much more like a, a user pay model. So that's where things like the hunting and fishing licenses come in. When you buy a hunting license, when you buy a fishing license, that money comes directly back to the department for the management of those species. We do have a couple of other funding sources. The most notable um, for what we're going to be talking about today is the Heritage Fund. The Heritage Fund was passed by the voters in the early 90s. And the, the purpose of it was basically to preserve Arizona's heritage. So a portion of the Heritage Fund goes to Arizona Game and Fish for the preservation of sort of our wildlife heritage. And a portion of the Heritage Fund goes to state parks for, for the kind of the preservation of our historical, cultural, um, natural um, heritage. The Heritage Fund actually comes from the state lottery. So when you buy a lottery ticket, a portion of the money goes towards the, the winnings, and then a portion goes towards various state uh, programs, one of those being the Heritage Fund. And that's what entirely funds the program that I'm going to be talking about today, um, which is our Focus Wild Arizona program, which is our sort of our K-12 sort of classroom program that has resources. And, I, and, I'll, and I'll show that in just a minute, but I want to just continue to tell you a little bit about myself. As, as we've said, my name is Eric Proctor, and I am the Wildlife Education Coordinator for the department. Um, so in that role, I like to tell people that I kind of work sort of behind the scenes. So you're not going to see me very often in classrooms giving presentations, um, just because one, we're, even though the Arizona Human Fish Department is a relatively large agency, uh, most of that is biologists and, and um um, wildlife managers and, and, and those types of people. Our education section is, is relatively small and we just don't have the staffing to be able to go into, since we also cover the state, we don't have the staffing to go into classrooms on a regular basis. Um, so what we do is we, we've we decided that there's tremendous value in reaching out to you guys as educators and kind of helping instill that passion and that, that in, you know, inspire you to like wildlife and then you can share that passion with your students. So that's mostly what I do is working on professional development, curriculum development, resource development, um, partnering with schools on different projects. Those types of things is really what, what I am interested in and what I do. I've been doing that for 17 years now. Uh, prior to that, I was actually a, a middle school science teacher. So I taught seventh grade science in both the <laughs> I taught it in both the um, the Littleton district over in Avondale and in the Kyrene district over in Chandler. Um, I've also I did that for a few years. Um, I've also have a lot of other what we call non formal science experience. So I've um, worked at the Arizona Sonoran Desert Museum, the Phoenix Zoo, the Challenger Space Center. I've done curriculum development for NASA. So all told, I've been involved in science education for you know 20, 25 years, um, doing this type of stuff both in and out of the classroom. So that's me. Um, and what I figured the easiest thing for me to do since Game and Fish, we aren't a facility in that we don't have a place where you can bring people to too much. We have a couple of these locations, but it's really hard. Uh, most of what we have when we have educational resources, we try to get them up and on our website as much as possible. And so what we're gonna do, I think, is delve into the website a little bit and show you some of the resources that we have. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the resources that are in development as well, um, because there's a lot. I am the only one in the department that does what I do when I've got a lot of projects going. And so I kind of wanna talk about a little bit of what that's, what that's there for. Um, and then like, if you have an idea, 
you can always reach out to me and I can I can say, hey, you know what, there, there's something that I don't have on the website and it's maybe not fully complete, but here's some information I can give you or here's a part part of a resource that maybe you can build on um, and do those types of things. Because I have a lot of these sort of projects that are um, kind of in the middle of being <laughs> developed and, and things like that. But I think we're, go we're gonna go ahead and um, delve right into the website. Um, our website, and I'm gonna put the website in the, in the chat in just a little bit, but I wanna make sure that you get a chance to see it first. And then um, on the, on, I'll have a slide that'll show you at the end that'll have a QR code on our website as well. But I just wanted you guys to be able to sit back and see where some of these things are. Um, I am gonna give you a caveat though, that our website is under um, development as well. This is, this is an older website that we have up. We are in the process right now of updating it. So I would think that within the next six to 12 months, we're gonna have a new website. So everything that I show you um, that the navigation might be a little different, but all the resources are still going to be there and then more as well, because I'm, I'm in the process of developing a lot of, of new resources. But anyway, Focus Wild Arizona is the name of our um, sort of our K-12 uh, education program. And so this is where we you're going to find a lot of our different resources. Um, and, you know, it works just like any other website on the left hand side. You've got a bunch of navigation pieces that we'll talk about. But I wanted to focus on the main page, first of all, because there's there's a lot of resources here that um, haven't we, we've been adding a whole bunch when COVID hit. Obviously, we made the same transition that a lot of a lot of organizations and, and teachers did is that that digital transition. We were developing a lot of digital resources. We we're helping teachers develop a lot of digital resources or work in the digital realm. And so a lot of that stuff hasn't found a permanent home on our website yet. They just sort of have these 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 things right now. So I wanted to kind of focus on some of these in the beginning, which is all this section right here on, on the, the popular links and sort of this learning from home section. I'm going to go ahead and click on that and I'll show you some of the some of the stuff that's in here. This learning from home section, like I said, was developed sort of um, during COVID to kind of provide resources for students and teachers. Some of the teacher part hasn't been updated because we were talking about some um, uh, workshops that has switched over to another spot and this page itself hasn't changed, but the student resources are still really, really valuable that are on here that, that, that I think can be um, useful for you. Um, the first thing that we did is we have these wildlife science at home resources. Now, this is these are sort of um, these easy to do like science experiments, science projects, science demonstrations, um, those types of things that students, kids can do at home with basically minimal materials, things that they might have at home, things like cups and napkins and popsicle sticks and and whatever. It's not designed to you know, they don't even need any specialty equipment like binoculars or or um, microscopes or anything like that and these got developed largely because um you know we've been big on stem at the game of fish for a long time as i mentioned i was a middle school science teacher when i taught i was big on um not just the stem piece of it but also the the integrated instruction multidisciplinary instruction so while we focus a lot on science we're going to have a lot of other things in there including social studies language arts um and then of course all the stem topics are going to be covered in here but one of my frustrations over the last decade or so in in the stem world um, has been that there's a lot of content and STEM stuff on a lot of the what we might call the more traditional sciences or the, the harder sciences sometimes they're called or the lab based sciences chemistry physics, even biochemistry, and, and those types of pieces those things that are easy to replicate in a, in a, in a classroom or in a lab setting. Um, ecology and those sort of wildlife sciences are a little bit harder because the science looks a little bit differently it's not always a controlled experiment. Um, you can't always account for the behavior of animals. And even with students, you can't always focus on using animals in the classroom or what that looks like. So I, I have found that over, it's gotten a little bit better, but when I first started in here, the STEM resources related to ecology and natural resources was somewhat limited. So we've been putting a big push on that. So this is a model of some of that stuff. And there's only four here, but we actually have 10 of them. And I'll show you in another spot where you can see them. But the wildlife science at home, these are these are the sort of activities that kids can do at home. They were designed to be um, relatively easy, um, where uh, kids can, um, like, the, the, the and I'll bring one up. I'm not sure. Let me see if I'll bring up the one on, um, I'll bring up one on ectotherms here. And I, again, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't logged into anything. All this is freely accessible directly from our website. It's a PDF that's available. It's a three page PDF. They're all built on the same formula and the same format. The first two pages is a student activity. And so this is designed for the student to have. Again, this was designed during COVID. And so this could be a kid working with their parents at home, but it doesn't mean that it also can't be a teacher that is assigned this either at home or in the classroom. Um, very simple. There's some stuff to get started. You can see the materials are relatively easy stuff that they can keep it that they should have at home for the most part. And if they don't, there's there's modifications to them. A little bit of a description. This one is on. It's a simulation that they do to simulate why ectotherms or cold-blooded animals have to, to to move around because they can't. They don't have 
um, the, the metabolism that allows them to control their body temperature um, and keep it stable, they rely on the, the environment to keep it stable. So in this case, they're creating a, a simulation where they, where they use bottles of water in different environments, and they're going to measure the heat um, that, it, that they accumulate over time throughout the day and stuff like that. So there's a, a little bit of a description, then there's procedures that the students would follow, and then each of them ends with a sort of think about section, which is their way to look at the results that they've gotten and, and um, kind of think about it and what would be next and stuff like that. And then the final page is for the teacher or the parent. It's not necessarily a full on lesson plan, but really just a guide for, hey, here's some suggestions. Here's some things that you need to think about when you're doing this. If there are any safety considerations, those get put in here as well. Ways to modify it, ways to extend it, um, depending on where the, where the students are. So there are a total of 10 of these, and I'll show you where the rest of them are. Again, this website, this part of the website hasn't really been updated in a little bit, um, but all of this stuff appears in there. The other one is our digital learning activities. In, the, in our digital learning activities, these were designed to, these are basically, um, they were modeled after what was making the rounds about two years ago, these sort of digital escape rooms where kids had to go through these different things and answer questions. And then they, they got bumped around to different things. Well, we took that concept and we built them based off of um, ecological principles or, or wildlife things. So we have one on bats and migrations. Uh, we have a really cool high school level one that's related to albinism and how, how, how rare is the white buffalo. Um, there's one on skulls. You can see all the different ones in here. Um, but basically, these are set up as a Google form that the, the, the kids can create. And we'll just look at one just really quickly here, the symbiotic relationships. These can be done in the classroom. They can be done at home, um, all different types of stuff. We give some directions on here that if you are using this in a classroom setting, like what the, what the, students, what the, the students can do, like to let you know that they've completed the assignment and stuff like that. But gives you a little bit of some information about symbiotic relationships and the, the activity. And then they go ahead and hit next. And then we talk about there's some information that's presented. There's usually a picture or some kind of question. They continue on through here. And eventually now they're being introduced to the different types of symbiotic relationships, in this case, mutualism, parasitism, and commensalism. And then we talk about how we represent those different things. And then they would click on them. And if they happen to get them, um, right or wrong, depending on what they do, it's going to tell them that, oh, you weren't correct on this one, go back and try again. It brings them back to the original question, and now they can go back and they can hopefully get the right answer. I still didn't get the right answer. I got to read the question and know what I'm doing here. Um, but eventually they get the right answer. It tells them they're correct, and they get to move on to the next one, and so on. So we have a whole collection of these wow. digital learning activities um, that are available to them. Again, it's not going to be your full on lesson, but this could be a supplementary activity. It could be an, a good activity to send home to kids that might miss your your, your um, lecture that day or, or you're teaching that day, whatever that might be. A kid that's going to be away on vacation, you're looking for assignments to give them, uh, preparation for a test coming up, all these different types of things these can be used for. Um, that's the, that's in there. Uh, we do have some other activity pages that I'm um, I'll, I'll go ahead and show you here that they're that they're up here. We have um, years ago, prior to when I was with the department. We had um, this mailer that we would send home to teachers that were on our mailing list, um, goes through snail mail. And then it was these activities that were geared toward different grade bands. Um, like I said, they're, they're, they're old. I've been with the department for 17 years and they were prior to that. Um, so we didn't do a lot with them anymore, but we actually still had some teachers that had been around for a while that still requested them. So what I did recently was I found all of them that I could. I went through our archives. I think we had about 30 or 40 of them. I went through all of them that I could still find. And then I started to, to work with them a little bit and try to see like, okay, if we were to bring this back into it, you know, how, how do we, you know, get it up to speed, you know, new scientific names, if there, if there were old scientific names in there. Um, and, you know, where do, where do they fall within the, the curriculum guidelines and the, and the standards and stuff like that? So I started going through those old activities. And those are what are called the wild kids. And so we've taken all those old ones. And we've actually now aligned them to specific grade levels and we've updated them a little bit. So these are these are um, all the different grade levels that are in here that are aligned to particular standards. So let's say you teach fourth grade. There's this one on endangered wildlife in Arizona. The content is geared toward what they might have in the standards. Again, it's basically a two page um, handout that you can give kids. This one is, um, it's, and then there's a, again, like the other one, there's a teaching guide associated with it. This one is, is more of a report that the kids have to do. Not all that exciting, but they all have some different things associated with them. Some of the early ones, they actually create a book. Um, this is a, a bat book um, where they actually get the little cutouts and they, they create a book on bats and then they answer some questions related to them. So, it, you know, they're, they're, these aren't super intense. But again, if you're just looking some, for some additional resources that are out there um, that you can give to kids as a supplement, um, those are out there. Related to that is our Focus Wild activities. So if you're not familiar, the Arizona Game and Fish Department, we publish our own magazine. It comes out six times a year. 
Um, it's actually not that expensive if you wanted to subscribe to it. I think it's like $8 or $10 for the year. It includes five regular issues. And then the last issue, which is the November, December issue is always our, our, our calendar issue. And so we, we actually have a, a, a photo contest that's available to the general public, and then you can get your photos into the calendar. And that, so that's the last issue. Um, but in that issue, in that magazine a few years ago, they used to allow me to have a two page pullout, which was an activity that I could include on some sort of science concept or whatever. Uh, we stopped doing that a few years ago, but um, all those activities are still available. Now, these ones have not necessarily been aligned to standards. Um, again, this was going into our magazine, so it was a general interest type magazine open for the, for the general public to sort of enjoy. Um, I geared them probably towards a third, fourth, fifth grade level. Doesn't mean that you can't use them in another level, and it doesn't necessarily guarantee they were aligned to standards at that at that thing. But again, if you're looking for some extra content or some fun activities or handouts to provide to um, students, um, you have all these different ones. It goes all the way back to 2006, but I kind of did what the different topics are. And so let's say again, we can go back to symbiotic relationships because I brought that one up before. Um, you go into symbiotic relationships. It's going again. It's going to be a little two pager because um, this was designed to go in a magazine and be pulled out of the magazine. It usually includes some vocabulary. There's usually some reading and then some questions they can answer. The questions could vary. There's sometimes there's a mapping activity. Sometimes it's a math activity. Sometimes it's a writing activity. Just kind of depends. So there's different types of activities that are related to there. Again, not correlated to standards, but it doesn't mean that they don't address the standards. So we just haven't gone through that time on these yet. Um, then I'm going to go ahead and I'll talk about some of these other things that are on here as well, because um, I think one of our coolest resources comes directly from what the teachers were telling us, and this is our reading wild page. Um, what we were hearing from teachers is that they really wanted some more um, nonfiction content um, discipline specific we, we would love some more readings and, and text in the sciences and. Um, that was great, and I totally understood that. The problem is, again, I'm one person, and I can't go through and just write a whole bunch of content for our, for our website. But as I mentioned, we have this magazine, and which has it's a general interest magazine. So sometimes you'll find fishing and hunting articles in it, but you'll also find some really cool articles on research that we're doing, or on an animal, or a place to go see uh, wildlife in the state of Arizona, or or anything like that. Um, so the content was already being generated. And so I was like, well, why don't I use this content that we're already creating and see if I can make that work for a classroom setting? And in theory, that worked out really well. The challenge is that our magazine, and not necessarily intentionally, um, because we don't run it through, the magazine publishers don't run it through anything in particular. But when I started running it through some, some of the analysis tools, I found out that most of the articles were written at a, like, at like a high school reading level which is actually higher than like what Time Magazine writes their articles at. Um, and I struggled with that. I was like, well, that's not going to work in a lot of cases. So what we did was we've been working on these leveled readers. And so we take the original article that's written at roughly a high school level, and we scale that article down to a, a lower Lexile level. We shoot for like a sixth or seventh grade Lexile level. Um, same article, we just scale it down. We, we shorten the sentences, we change some of the vocabulary. So the content is still there for the most part. We just change it so that it's not as complex of, a, of an article. And and then we scale that sixth or seventh grade article down to an even lower Lexile level to, to shooting for that third or fourth grade level. So every article in our series now has um, three different reading levels that they're out. And then in addition to that, we create um, text dependent questions to go along with them as well as some critical thinking questions. So they're going to mirror some of the stuff that they're going to see on um, like uh, a standardized test. It's very similar to what you might see with a site like Newzella. Or something like that. We just have it um, focused on our magazine. So this is the actual page that you'll get um, when you come in here. And there's a couple different ways you can search for it. You can actually search for the Lexile level of your students or what which one you want. And I'll show you that in just a minute. You can also search by a specific topic. So if you're interested in looking at adaptations, for example, you can look at ones that have been set for, for adaptations. You can also just do a general search. So let's say you were interested in looking for something on bats. You can click on bats and you can um, bring up the, uh, two, we have two two articles that are on bats. And I'm gonna just bring up one of these. This is a brand new one that we just did, this glow by night. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and click on it and I'm gonna show you what this looks like again. So this is the resource. It shows you, it tells you a little bit about the article. If you wanna download the reading, again, I have not logged into anything. I can just click download readings. I'll bring that up in just a minute. But then there's all kinds of information. This is gonna tell you the different Lexile levels that are found at this particular one. So we go all the way down to a, basically a 600, an 800, and a 1200 are the three different levels. Again, same article, just scaled to different levels. Um, and then we do correlate to some standards on grade levels that approximate to where that reading level is. 
fully understanding that you as an educator, you could be teaching seventh grade and you might have somebody reading in a third grade level. And that's 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 going to happen. So you as an educator have some flexibility when you're using these particular resources. You could print out all three of them and have all three available to your students. So if you have the higher readers, they can be reading the higher ones. And if you have lower readers, they can be reading the lower level, still getting the same content. Or you might just decide, you know what, I really just like the middle level on this particular article. And I'm going to give all my students the middle level article because um, I think it's better written or, or whatever it might be. Um, so there's options that you have as an educator. There's also some related resources. Um, so other activities that tie in with what was covered in this article or other information. But if you're interested in the reading, you just click download reading. And what it's going to do is bring up a PDF with all of that information directly to you. So again, the teaching guide comes in the front. This is all the same information you just saw on the website we had up. Um, so if you did choose to print this out, there's the key to the to the text dependent questions and all that that are in there, um, options to extend the learning. Um, but this is the actual article. So if it has an A on it, that's the lowest of our article, or the lowest level. You'll notice here, 610, the, the font is a little bit larger. The sentences are a little bit smaller. They're all set up. Um, they all follow the same little format. Um, and then there are the text dependent questions that, cut, that tie in with that article, as well as the um, critical thinking questions. And then the second article is the middle article. Font gets a little bit smaller, um, continues on through here, text dependent questions, critical thinking. And then the third article is the original article. And so again, a much larger, longer article. This is going to have more of the higher end science terms and things like that, but they all follow the same format. So you read it and then you have the, the text dependent questions and the critical thinking questions. So this is one that we've been spending a lot of time on trying to address some of the needs that teachers are having um, related to if, you, if you're looking at bringing some of that literacy into your classroom. I'm going to focus on a couple more, and then um, these are some of our bigger resources, and then I'll just highlight very, very quickly um, the rest of the website and some of the things you can find. The other thing we've been doing is we've been, um, we have a, a get, department has a rather extensive YouTube library. If you're not familiar, just like we have our own magazine, we have our own TV show called also Arizona Wildlife Views. Both our magazine and our, our TV show are called the same thing. It airs on PBS. Um, so most, I know Phoenix and Tucson, they air on, on the, the PBS stations in there. And then I think the other communities, it depends on the, the PBS just kind of airs them at random times. Um, but we take all those ones that air on PBS and we put all the episodes on YouTube. And in fact, we split them up. A, a normal 30 minute episode might have three or four um, stories in it. We take those individual stories and separate them out on our YouTube page. So our YouTube page has probably a thousand videos on it. Um, so a great resource for some cool content to bring in your classroom, but can be overwhelming. If you're trying to find something on a specific site, just searching that YouTube page um, may not be as useful. So the other thing that we have been doing is we've been curating our, our YouTube library. And so we have a curated library, which is available um, on the Focus Wild page. We have not gone through all thousand videos yet, and we probably won't get through all thousand of them. We're kind of prioritizing based on topics and some of the, the, the content we think is most relevant to education. Um, but so this now takes those YouTube videos that we have on our library and now makes them a little bit more user friendly for the educator. Again, completely searchable. This time you can search by grade level um, or again by topic. So this time I'm going to say, let's say I'm interested in fourth grade. Click on fourth grade. What it's going to do is it's going to bring up all the different types of videos that we have available right now for fourth grade. And I'm just going to bring up this one right here called Amazing Grace. This happens to be about a, um, a raccoon. I think it was a raccoon. Was it a raccoon? Um, that was discovered after the Yarnell fire, um, and it was, its legs were burned and all that stuff, and it actually came to us briefly to get medical care, and then um, ended up at the Heritage Park uh, Zoo up in, up in Prescott um, for a while. Um, but anyway, here's the information on that. It gives you a little bit of a description of the video, and then the video is embedded right here on the page if you wanted to do that. But we also have the link down here, as well as the runtime, the grade levels that we feel that the content is appropriate for. And we're basing that on two different things. Um, one, is it content that's co that's covered? Is it, does it hit standards that are addressed at that grade level? And two, um, sometimes the con the video may be a little bit more complex. So we may only have it at our higher levels or secondary levels. Um, but if it's a easy easier content to grasp, then we'll have them at lower. Obviously, you introducing this as a, as an educator in a third grade classroom is going to look. Um, different than you introducing in a high school classroom. And that's kind of going to be up to you as an educator to kind of figure out, but we do at least give you some hints. For each video, then we actually have two different types of questions. The potential discussion questions, this is designed if you don't want, if you want the video to be a little bit more interactive, you don't just want to throw the video up and make it run and have the kids watch it. This would be you watch it and then at certain times during the video, you pause the movie and you discuss 
what was just talked about here to make sure that there's some understanding going on. Again, these are potential questions. You as an educator don't need to use any of these. We're just providing them as, as another tool for you. And then the, the critical thinking questions, again, this is really where we dive into the standards a little bit more in detail. They, they go, you've watched the video. Now you have your kids think a little bit more in depth on some of the, some of the concepts that were introduced in the, in the thing. And you can see here the questions then based on, on what, which question and what grade level you're teaching. And just like before, there's some additional resources for you to go back and access. So another, just these cool resources that, that are already out there and available to you. The last one I'm going to show you right now is our um, live webcams. Live webcams took off during the <laughs> during the pandemic, um, and since then they um, continue to be very very popular. Ours have been hit or miss depending on the, the you know the technology to run a webcam in the wild is is incredibly difficult. Um, you have to have the service, you have to have all this different type of stuff. So, um, and you also have to have animals that are going to be able to, to to use them. You you know we have a bald eagle webcam at Lake Pleasant. We had it there. We, it was really successful for a year or two, and then the bald eagles decided to nest at a different location. Um, even though they're pretty nest specific, um, this particular group does move between two or three nests. And for the last couple of years, they have not used the nest that we have the camera at. And so that's not as exciting. Um, the great horned owl cam was put up during the, um, it, was, it was in a location and they started nesting right in March, basically that time in, when COVID happened, March 2020. And so all through COVID, our great horned owl cam was, was phenomenal. People got to see um, the two babies being raised and it was really cool. Great horned owl, owls aren't there anymore. So the ones that, are, that I'd like to direct people to the most is our bat cam and our sandhill crane cam. The bat cam is actually active right now. And if you were to go to our bat cam, um, this is this is live now. You can actually see these bats moving around and they're, they're they're bouncing around and they do have sound. And so you would have the capability of actually sitting here and listening to them on your on your um, on your computer and, and so on. Um, we do a lot of activities with using ethograms. If you're not familiar, ethograms are a biologist's way of um, studying animal behavior. So it's a chart that you monitor behavior. We've been doing a lot of trainings on how to um, use webcams, live streaming webcams to use ethograms and use it for scientific data analysis and, and stuff like that. Um, so those are all some resources that you can find. The Sandhill Crane Cam is probably my favorite cam, but the Sandhill Cranes are not in Arizona right now. They are, um, they come, they're migratory and they come, they start arriving in Arizona right around October and they stay here through about March. And so through, from October to March, it's a phenomenal camera. If you're not familiar with the Sandhill Crane migration, there's about 30,000 Sandhill Cranes that come to Southeastern Arizona in the Wilcox area and the, um, the Sulphur Springs area basically is where they come and they spend the winter here. And we have a camera on one of our game and fish properties where we see about 15 to 20,000 Sandhill Cranes and you can come out here and it's phenomenal. If you ever get the experience to see it in person, it's phenomenal. Um, but you you can put this camera up and you can hear the sounds of them squawking and doing all that type of stuff. It's really cool. Camera's not out open right now for two reasons. One, all you would see is landscape because there's nothing out there. And two, that big storm that hit about a week ago knocked our camera down. So we're in the process of getting it put back up, hopefully before the sandhill cranes start to migrate in. Um, so I, I wanted to bring all those things up. What I'm going to do really quickly is just go back to our main website and I'm going to you know, haul through some really quick resources and to highlight some other ones. I wanted to focus on those really big ones. Um, but the next one I really want to focus on is our educational grants. Um, we, our grants are open right now and they're, they're due September 1st, but this is an opportunity and I've been doing some webinars on these. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time, but you'll have all the information that you write, need here. This is the opportunity for, get, for you to get up to $3,000 to bring into your classroom. It can be used for field trips. It can be used for wildlife resources, all different types of stuff. Um, but from here, you can apply for the grant. It's an online application. Uh, we do webinars. I finished my last one yesterday, but what I'm going to be doing in this spot is I'm going to be putting up the PDF of the, of the slide deck so you can at least see the slide deck of the presentations. And then if I get to the recording, I'll post the recording. But this other one, is, I'm posting these one-on-one -on -one meetings. I'm doing these through the end of August. Um, so if you go through the grant stuff and you have questions or you want to run an ID and say, hey, look, I wonder if you would fund this. Um, you can set up a one-on-one, so you, all you have to do is schedule a one-on-one -on -one virtual chat. It brings up my calendar, shows you the times that I have available for you, for you to meet. You schedule that, and what I do is I'll send you a Google Meet link, and we'll chat for about 30 minutes to kind of talk about your grant ideas and things like that. And so I don't want to spend a ton of time on that, but the application is due September 1st if you, if you want to. We do have a second round of scoring that takes place in January. However, it's the same pot of money, so if we spend all the money in September, we don't do the January scoring. So I really encourage people to try to get it in by September. 
Um, so last things then, of course, all the stuff can be found on here. Um, the other one I want to talk about real quickly is our workshops, because if you're not familiar, I do a number of workshops across the state of Arizona. I do different types of workshops from webinars where we'll actually um, cover content, obviously, virtually in a format much like this. But I also do a lot of in-person workshops, and most of our workshops are free. There's a few cases where I do have to charge a nominal fee for a workshop. It might be $15, $20, $25. And the reason for that is largely because of, of the law. We are a state government agency. We are not allowed to gift things to people. And so when we host a free workshop, um, we, we're really limited on the resources we're allowed to provide to people um, because of um, that law that's in place. So if I wanna be able to give you a book or a resource or something else, I have to charge a nominal fee to basically cover the cost of those. But these are the workshops that I have currently scheduled right now. And I'm gonna go back real fast because if you didn't see how I got here, I clicked on workshops over here on the left-hand side, and then right under scheduled workshops, it says visit our workshop calendar. I click on that. These are the workshops that are active right now that are going to that we're taking registrations for right now. I'm going to be adding to these, but you can see there are virtual ones like our webinar here. We have a really popular uh, webinar series called the Unlovables, in which we feature. Um, those animals that people have a hard time appreciating. So we've done rodents and we've done coyotes and vultures and bats. Um, we're going to do, be doing arachnids this year. We're going to be doing snails. In fact, I've got my snails and slugs one up here. We're going to be doing other creepy crawlies, like things like centipedes and millipedes and those types of things. And then I'm also doing one on snakes later in the year. Um, so these have been a very, very popular webinar series, and our webinars are designed for educators. And so the intent is we will cover the content, but we'll also introduce ways that you can bring this into your classroom so that we can talk about like, oh, here's an, an activity idea or something like that. So it's, it's you're going to get the content, but you're also going to get it from, a, from an educator friendly perspective. I'm doing a lot of in person workshops as well. So I have this one on uh, wildlife literacy that I'm doing at the Tempe Library on September 17th. I'm doing this really fun one that's gonna be how to teach scientific notebooks and nature journaling, even if you can't draw yourself. So we're gonna talk about the, the value of things like scientific notebooks and field notes and how even a, a, a limited knowledge of drawing, just being able to piece together some information can still serve very, really important roles. We're actually gonna have some examples of some not so pretty nature journals that are famous and um, historical that helps us identify certain species and things like that. And then I have one on GIS. I do a really popular two-day GIS mapping workshop where we, where we take you from collecting data in the field to adding your data to an interactive map and then ultimately creating like a story map or a way to present your map out and creating these digital things. That's a two-day workshop. Um, I'm going to be adding some wildlife ones. I'm working right now with our biologist on doing a bobcat workshop in which we're going to get you out in the field with our biologist while she is trapping the bobcat. So you will get to see a live wildlife trapping, a collaring, hopefully, Obviously, the challenge with dealing with wildlife is the wildlife don't always know that we need them to be at certain places at certain times. And so, but you'll at least be in the field with a biologist. If she traps the, the, the bobcat, you will get to see how we put the collars on them and how that, that process. And then we'll also talk about ways to bring bobcat information into your classroom. Um, so those are the big things that I really wanted to focus on. I have a bunch of other resources. I do have a section on here called classroom programs. We don't have a lot on classroom programs right now, just because, as I mentioned at the beginning, very, very small staff, but that might change in the future. So we do have some spots on there, but really we're somewhat limited on that. But the big one is the resources page. Now, under the resources page, you're going to see all the resources that I've already introduced to you. So I'm not going to talk about them again. There's those easy science experiments, the reading resources, the video guides. The only one that I didn't talk about is our wildlife phenomenon. Phenomena obviously is a, is a big part of the new science standards, um, whether it's NGSS in other states or whether we're based off of the, the science framework, we're using wildlife phenomena. But just like in STEM, when I made the argument about STEM, how sometimes we were neglecting the wildlife sciences, I'm seeing the same thing in phenomena. We're seeing a lot of phenomena on chemistry and physics and those types of things, but not as much on wildlife. So what I've been doing is I've been recruiting teachers and we're building a phenomena database um, that's focused on wildlife type stuff. And it's still being built. Uh, we have a few phenomena on there, but by January, I'm going to have probably a, a, a pretty extensive library that's going to be built on there. And all of our phenomena are going to have the phenomena, whether it's a picture, whether it's a video, whatever it might be. We're going to give you suggestions on how to use this in the classroom um, and, and things like that. Obviously, phenomena are pretty open. It's based on the kids kind of discovering and asking questions. But we're going to give you some suggestions on really this is what we think the content is that you can teach and, and stuff like that. Other than that, I encourage you to explore our resources section. We have a ton of other resources that are on here but I really wanted to focus on those few. And so with that, I talked a little bit longer than I was originally planning. Well, um, I kind of said those few, like just a couple. <laughs> he just shared a few resources with us folks. I don't know that Marnie could get those into the chat quick enough. Like that, 
I just said, Eric, I'm impressed. Wow, what a plethora of information. Mm -hmm. And I'm just excited about everything you're doing we have some questions in the chat mostly from me so i'm going to ask <laughs> these two questions to start sure. off and then marnie if i miss anything please let me know um the first one was the magazine um can teachers get the magazine and can they pay with a purchase order like if they want to subscribe they want to tell their principal hey i want to get this in print version can they you know subscribe and, and do you take a purchase order that's number so one I, I think we can do a purchase order, but I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I'm going to show you how to get there. And then um, what I can do is I can follow up because I don't handle that stuff. It's all done through our publications department and stuff like that. But I can certainly try to follow up and see what that would look like. Um, but this is our main game and fish site now. This is azgfd.gov. Um, and then if you were to scroll all the way down to the bottom, if you clicked on teachers, that's how you can get to the website. But the other one here is right here under multimedia there's the thing that says magazine so if you click on magazine it's going to give you the information on the magazine um and it shows you how do you can actually start or renew a subscription you can pay with a credit card um i'm sure if you were to do depending on how your school sets up the po's and those types of things if you could do it by a check then there's a system there um or doing this through your purchasing so there's probably a way i just don't handle a lot of that stuff so i wouldn't okay. be able to figure that out um the other cool thing i will show you though is not only do you get the print magazine which is really cool full color and all that type of stuff but we also now in the last few years we've got a digital version of the magazine and so your subscription will include the digital archives so this goes all the way back to 2016 and they're really really cool so our, our latest one is july and august so when you open up the July and August issue, um, this is the version of the magazine digitally now. So you flip the pages just like you would, but because it's digital, it allows us to add some other content. So in this case, there's a video that ties in with this um, and all kinds of stuff. So you get access to that with your subscription as well. So Okay, that's really cool. I'm glad I asked that question because that digital piece kind of connects Mm -hmm. um, a lot together. So that's really awesome. The I also part about the digital as well is um, you can print the things out as PDFs. So you can print out specific articles um, as PDFs if you wanted to. Even cooler. All right. So this next question is, I see the Facebook page that it's also connected with Arizona Game and Fish. Who's the great, who's the best audience for that? Is that something that students can follow as far as social media is concerned? Is it better for yeah, so the, the our, our our main Facebook page is going to be our main department one, and we have a, we have a social media person that just runs that. Um, it's it, anybody can do it, but it's going to be again, it's it's like our magazine or like our video. It's going to be very general interest. Um, and so you're going to see stuff on hunting stuff. You're going to see some stuff. We we just had something on our tortoise adoption program just went out there on la yesterday on that. Um, so I would say um, I, I'm not sure I would bring it entirely into the classroom. Um, I would look at what content is on there and see what's on what's appropriate to bring to classroom. Um, I run a, a Facebook page as well for Focus Wild, and it's it's that one's geared toward teachers. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll say, hey, we we just open up a new workshop or something like that. But our main game and fish one, which has you know forty thousand followers or whatever it is, um, that's more of a general interest, uh, general public type of thing. Okay, perfect. Great, great answers. Um, I'm excited about that. Marnie, do, did I miss anybody else's question in there? No, it was just you and I kind of pumping that full of stuff, but oh my gosh. Right? <laughs> I'm at, I am embarrassed. I mean, I've been a biology teacher in this state for how long? I've, you know, more than 16 years. I've used Arizona Game and Fish resources, but I use essentially nothing compared to what you have. That's incredible. It's a, it's a lot. Thank you. Oh my. Absolutely. And to know that you're like solo. I mean, you've been doing this, uh, you're, you're like curating all of this information and we appreciate mm -hmm. it so much. Um, folks, we have a couple of minutes left before we move over to the petrified forest. So if you have a question for Eric, feel free to unmute. Uh, if you want, you know, if, if you're like, like I am, which is like fire hose information, but so good. And I got all lost in the bat cam and I'm like, oh man, I want to go see the owls now. And anyway, you might be like me, but if you aren't and you have a particular question, please pop it into the chat or feel free to unmute and give it to Eric directly. You've got lots of great compliments in here, Eric. Um, Thank you. Impressive. And I know, um, Marnie just put my email in there. That's the easiest way to get in touch with me. I'm 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 only in the office a couple of days a week now, so email is the, the best way to to get through to me. My web the website's up there, and then the QR code that's showing will take you directly to the website as well. So, 
And Eric, are there any other initiatives that you wanted to remind us of? I know that you talked about the grants um, earlier, but is there something else, uh, for example, rural education? Uh, we, we do a lot of work with rural STEM at Grand Canyon University, and we'd love to share whatever initiatives you have if you're looking for more teachers as a part of something so like yeah so we're, we're actually involved in a group that that's a, uh, a rural stem sort of um professional learning community that we just started up and we're only like a month or two old into it and we actually have a meeting coming up this friday it's a virtual meeting at four um and i don't i unfortunately I didn't come prepared for that i don't have that specifics but if anybody was interested in that and particularly in a rural school in arizona or you think that that you you could use the support of rural schools and, and some of these that that outreach um just send me an email and i will send you the information on getting involved in that um we we're, we're meeting uh basically once every month or so and then every every like three to four times a year we're going to be looking at doing a field trip a teacher field trip where we're going to take you out to a really cool like um, STEM focused place and um, kind of explore that area, talk about how we might use it in the classroom and those types of things. All of our other meetings are going to be virtual though. Um, we're going to be meeting and, and chatting so we can we can get people from across the state. So if you're interested in that, um, send me an email and I'll make sure that we get you added on. So even if you can't make Friday, you can get on the list so that you'll get future notifications. You have lots, lots to share. Thank you so much for your time and your effort and your energy and all that you do for our Arizona educators and beyond, um, because ultimately we want other people to know how cool Arizona Game and Fish uh, is. So thank you, Eric. And with Great. Well, uh, welcome to Petrified Forest National Park. I'm a park ranger, Ranger Emily. Um, and I am the education coordinator here, and I've been here for about a year and a half, um, and we do not have quite the resources developed that Eric does, <laughs> but I guess that just shows that we move around a lot. We're not always the same person um, in charge. I think I remember not working with Eric, but knowing of him when I was down at Saguaro at the beginning of my career and thinking, I got to reach out to him to figure out how to do this, so. <laughs> Wait, figure out how to do what? You're the beginning um, of your teaching career. How to, how to make STEM education alive as like an agency. Um, so I've been a park ranger for about 11 years now. Um, before that, I was a middle school science teacher um, down in Tucson, Arizona. So yay, middle school science. <laughs> And I've always loved since then, everywhere I've gone, everywhere I've worked, I've worked in education. And I, wow, like I'm inspired just from listening to Eric and I like have all these notes of things I need to make or work on or create um, for us here because we are, we have so much, we're so rich in science. Um, so that's me, I'm from Tucson. I've been a park ranger for 11 years and here I am. Um, in petrified forests where things are old, but things are also very living. Um, so I have some pictures. I'm not sure I had quite the right focus when I developed things, but we'll go for it um, yeah. and it'll be great. The pictures are awesome. So let me, all right. So we are um, full of geology, um, fossils, killer landscapes, but we are so much more. And that there's a lot of natural science and a lot of cultural science that um, we can tap into here at um, Petrified Forest. So here's a beautiful view of um, the Painted Desert Inn historical landmark and the Painted Desert behind it. And just a shout out for STEM, we do have an artist in residence program. Um, this is one of our art art artists from this year, Alyssa. Um, she was a neon light artist and made this awesome sculpture or light of the Blue Mesa region um, in the park. So um, I have that actually as one of my cool to-do lists on my to-do list is to try to see how we can make art more into the classroom. Um, so if you got an idea, let me know, but um, that's cool. So here I am in my natural habitat. Um, we do several in-park programs. This is one, um, a simulated fossil dig. So I take third to fifth grade students and we put on our paleontology hats, paleontologist hats, and we learn about doing field work and how it's hot and sweaty and you have to hike out to it. 
Um, and then we find things and then we have to identify them and we write them in our field notes. Um, Yay, you're it's, writing. <laughs> Thank it's you so much, much fun. It's a lot of fun. Um, my favorite was I had a kid ask me, am I the first one to find this fossil? And I said, you are today. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best way to do it. Um, we also, the other um, most popular in-park education program that we do is uh, a hike out to the clam beds. And we just try can I take that different, depends on the age, the grade and what the focus is, but the rock cycle, a weathering and erosion, um, how we use that uh, to make hypothesis of the earth's history. Um, and lately I've been tying it in to the Mars research and our landscape here in Petrified Forest looks very similar to what's on Mars. So we are using what we know here um, to tell maybe what happened on Mars and maybe where we can find life based on just the uh, the geology and the land and the, the land architecture, you could call it. Um, there, I also have, I don't have a picture of it, but I do virtual programs. Um, lots of times it's just an overview, but I'm very happy and willing to work with teachers to make it into whatever they need from, from us. Uh, I did one on uh, endangered and extinct animals once and got um, for like third grade. And it was so fun to have them think about like what did happen? Why don't we have these giant phytosaurs that look like crocodiles but are the size of school buses? Why don't we have them anymore? What makes things um, disappear um, over time or what changes come or why things don't disappear? So it was awesome. So I love that. Um, our resources on our website, um, don't drop it in the chat. <laughs> Probably not the best right now. There are some, they're very dated and old. It reminded me a lot of what I've done when I was a student, which was a while ago, um, but they're there. Um, if you wanna check them out, you can, but uh, the remainder of my uh, pictures here are from the active science that we are currently doing in the park. And I am very willing and very happy to figure out how to bring that into that educational setting um, for your students, for students in general, um, but it's super cool. So um, this is a volunteer and he is working on preparing a fossil out of a jacket that we have removed from um, an active quarry here in the park. We're still finding fossils of things we know about, but things we don't know about. So he has specialized tools that he's using and they're those magnifying glasses to uh, remove the rock um, and the other debris around it. Um, if you come to visit, we do have a demonstration lab that is open for public viewing Wednesdays through Sundays. And you can watch them and interact with the paleontologists doing this kind of work. Um, and some of the things that they've been working on are um, these jackets. Um, these are metoposaur skulls. And that is like a six foot salamander type animal um, from the Triassic period, 220 million years ago. Um, the one on the right, the smaller one is the typical skull that we find here. Um, but they have been working on this giant one that's on the left um, this last year. And it will soon be on display in our, our Rainbow Forest Museum um, here in the park. So super cool. They've also been working on some phytosaur material and revoltosaur, which were ancient reptiles. There's the phytosaur um, size, of, size of the school bus um, to put that in perspective. Um, this on the, the left there, we have our some volunteers and um, a seasonal ranger out in a quarry. Um, their focus this last year or these last couple of years have been on the micro vertebrate layer. So they're collecting material, they call it material, and then they go back in the lab and they wash it and strain it and sort it. Um, and they're finding teeny tiny things. So on the right, um, that's a copolite, copolite, um, and that is petrified poop. Um, but their focus on looking at this micro vertebrate layer is to learn more about the community as a whole that lived here and what changes took place over time to better understand 
uh, the history um, of the Triassic area of the earth. Um, and that makes a lot of sense. If you go out in your backyard, you might not catch a rabbit or a deer, but you'll definitely catch lizards and bugs and that those micro things. Um, so here are some of the micro fossils that they have picked out from debris. Um, on the upper left-hand corner, we have fish scales. We find a lot of fish scales and then the right side are teeth and the bottom one is jawbone. Um, and they're soup, they're like the size of a grain of sand. So that's what the fossil preparer does sometimes, decide what's a bone and what's a grain of sand under the microscope. Um, but super cool. They're finding new things. They're just gathering all the data right now. And I'm sure something big will be coming soon, a new discovery. Um, one new discovery that we have made in the last couple of years is this creature. It's called the Azendosaur, and it's um, an ancient lizard the size of an iguana um, that was new. It's a new species found in Arizona. So not new to the world. It's also found in India and Morocco, but new here, um, which is super cool. And there should be a scientific paper published shortly um, about this coming out. And I think I might take a, a tip from Eric on how to make something super scientific um, readable by elementary and middle school kids, because it's super fun or super cool that we're finding new things um, still here. Um, so this is our paleontologist, Adam, and he is using one of our new toys. We got a 3D scanner that allows us to scan um, fossils from the outside and make a digital, what's, what do you call it? A digital 3D mesh of it. So sometimes we can't clean all the debris off, but this will allow us to actually see the fossil um, and create a database for my brain exploded students to use <laughs> to find similarities, maybe learn about form versus function um, and compare animals across um, time eras really. Um, and then on the right is a CT scan. That's something that we're also investigating is using CT, same as a hospital CT scan, only it's a higher power because we don't have to worry about killing anything because they're already dead. Um, but this allows us to see the internal structures and again, understand more about these ancient creatures that roam the earth. Um, and how they're related to us. Okay, that's, that's all the, the paleo stuff. Um, we also have biologists and live biology coming. These are images from our recent prairie dog relocation project. And this was funded by a grant from the National Park Foundation and our museum association. And we actually have funding for future years um, as well, but we paired up with Habitat for Harmony out of Flagstaff, and that is a animal rescue group. So these prairie dogs were rescued from a construction site in Flagstaff um, and then brought to us where we relocated them um, to where we have had previous prairie dog colonies that have, that aren't active anymore. Um, so they did a lot of measuring and ear tagging and um, stuff so we can keep track of them in the future. Um, I think, yeah, that's all my notes on the prairie dogs. So that's fun. Everyone loves furry animals um, in the park. And then also biology, we have a lot of night surveys or animal surveys in general. So the picture on the far, far left shows a gentleman I'm holding a flashlight as another um, member from one of the work crews in Native Conservation Corps that was here working. It looks like he's got a snake that they're um, inventorying, identifying, checking the health condition, and then they record it in their field notes. Um, and then we also have herpetology surveys going on, and this is the tiniest lizard that our biologist has ever caught in a herp trap. Um, it's super tiny <laughs> and super cute. Um, but they also have a acoustic bat monitoring going on. Um, and if you want to find more out about our wildlife, uh, our social media posts on Wednesdays are always about wildlife. And there's some really cute 
um, videos that our biologist has made about the prairie dogs and and just just the wildlife that are here in the park today. So that's like the natural science. We also have cultural science, and I'm not sure where that fits in with STEM, to be honest, but we do a lot of monitoring of cultural artifacts um, that we have at archaeological sites. I know they're doing a lot of um, monitoring and preservation work in adobe, not adobes, we don't have adobes, true adobes, but in pueblos and other structures that are found throughout the park. We're inventorying for the first time a lot of our, the civilian conservation core sites, because that is now considered part of our historic record. It's old enough, <laughs> I guess. Um, but they are all, they got some new technology, some new tablets and software to help us organize that data. Um, and then a shout out to our museum association who does funding for um, the many paleo projects and the biology projects, um, but they offer support in different ways. They also run the Petrified Forest Institute, um, and this is their um, website. They offer custom trips and classes to people into parts of the park that um, aren't normally open. Um, they can do that as an educational entity. Um, so they're also a great resource, um, but I, I would love <laughs> to also be a resource. And then here's just another beautiful view of petrified forest um, out here. It's so, it's, there's so many different things out here. So um, that's some of the cool science going on. And I'm definitely gonna try to incorporate that more into, um, into the education programs, so. Um, love if you would like to help me with that, <laughs> request something, um, and I can drop my email um, into the chat as well. My so, last name can be kind of tricky. So all we have to do is request something. That's kind of, Yeah, that's I mean, I'll do my best to meet those requests right now because we don't really have a lot like um, fossil dig program or a hike. Um, that's what I was gifted when I got here a year ago, but I think we could definitely like ramp it up. Like we're so cool. Exciting opportunities. I just, I don't know about anybody else, but the tiny little tiny baby lizard. Oh my gosh. That's <laughs> so cute. I, I just, yeah. it's so unique. It's such a unique opportunity to learn STEM as STEM is happening all around you. So thank you so much for all of those yeah. resources. And I just, I just thought of too, we do have some grant opportunities to help with transportation out to the park, but they are very, very, very limited. Um, but I would just contact me or check on the website. There's a, you can also, also put in another um, email address uh, in the chat. Um, I, mine, my emails sometimes get lost because I'm also the volunteer coordinator. So that is uh, PFO underscore education is my education one. So I keep all the, you know, I can keep that separate and keep track of it. Um, oh, that's great. So, so you have yeah, a just, grant for transportation. Yeah, yeah. It just depends on how much the museum association can contribute and what other grants we have um, received. But definitely love bringing kids out to the park. Um, it is not like your backyard. <laughs> no. not at all no i want to touch emily really quick back you had mentioned briefly the cultural studies and cultural science that's going on and weren't sure how that applies to stem that absolutely mm -hmm. applies to stem cool. i mean um learning in place and cultural knowledge how we can apply cultural knowledge to our understanding of the natural world is very important mm -hmm. um, and cool. something that we're really trying to bring into classrooms so that that that's a, a of great interest to science teachers. Absolutely. Yes. Awesome. Right. I just, I've worked at other sites and that was a big thing, the traditional um, knowledge. So I made note that I need to look into that. But you know what, Emily, there's a lot of grants right now in diversity, equity, and inclusion in STEM. And, and uh, I see Manny and Andrea just like, yep, because these Mesa is all about it. And and I think that a lot of our instructors uh, for Mesa Math Engineering Science Achievement would really appreciate, there she is, I like it, I like it, would really appreciate the uh, 
the diversity and inclusion because really it's for underrepresented students in STEM. And so that is absolutely, as Marnie said, I'll just dovetail on her, her comments. It's very, very important. So thank you for bringing that up. Uh, what questions do we have? I know there was something from Eric about uh, partnering on a teacher workshop. So Eric, if you are- Yeah. Eric, are you still here? Do you wanna ask? Do you wanna talk about that? <laughs> Sure, I, Emily. I, I'm actually drafting an email right now too, but um, awesome. <laughs> but I was, um, you know, obviously I do a lot of teacher professional development and and working with, you know, because we don't have a lot of facilities ourselves to do stuff. We we manage the wildlife, but we don't have a lot of land and, and facilities. So I'm always looking for those cool partners um, and places that you know we can we can share with teachers, but also give some cool things. And and I know that we we we've been partnering with you guys as a department on the bio bliss that takes place every year. At the the petrified forest as well. Um, so I've been doing some citizen science trainings as well with teachers, and I think that that might be a cool way. But I think there's some other ways. Um, I've been wanting to do a a workshop focused on prehistoric wildlife and how that connects to today's wildlife and stuff like that. And I think cool. that there might be some some cool opportunities. And I was wondering if that might be something you'd be interested in at least opening up a discussion and seeing what that could potentially look like as far as getting some teachers out there and running some programs like this. Yeah, uh, that I sounds that. awesome to me. Yeah, I know when I was a teacher, I would have loved to do something like that. And so I'm always like, can we do teacher workshops? Like, why are we talking to teachers? Because they all can't come bring their students to the park, but they can bring the park to their students. Like, so yeah, yeah. Um, if cool. not me, I've, I've learned here at Petrified Forest, it's a lot of the, like, the museum people and the paleontologists that do those things. I don't, I do the fossil digs in the sandbox, but I can totally connect or maybe this is my way to get in. There you go. And, and like I said, I, you know, I'm, I'm used to running the, the PD part of it. So that's not the issue. And, but, you know, working with you guys on the facility and, and experts and, and that type of stuff would be really cool. So I'll, I'll drop you an email and we can maybe look at getting something going. So. Cool. Awesome. And and maybe even in March because that's going to be a big a big uh, teacher professional development at the Petrified Forest. Cece mm -hmm. and myself and and Marnie have talked to you, uh, Emily, about putting together a teacher workshop up in the Petrified Forest. We're really looking forward to continuing the discussions about that. Um, so and and obviously we want to include Mesa teachers uh, to get them up there and definitely get them um, having some fun with their Mesa clubs. Wouldn't that be fun, Manny, to have the, just the clubs traveling rather? It doesn't have to be the whole mm -hmm. student body, but really we could even yeah. get three Mesa clubs together uh, to get up there and, 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 and get the teachers trained first and then bring the students. Yeah, that'd, that'd be great. That'd be great. Yeah. And, and I'm sure we could probably help out and, you know, maybe grab a group of folks from Tucson or a group of folks from Phoenix and, you know, carpool them up there for a teacher training or something like that. Yeah. Let's talk. Andrea, oh, help me with ASDM. There could be some coordination with it. Go ahead. Well, I'm just spitballing. I don't know what boundaries and things would need to be negotiated or if it couldn't happen, but it's the Arizona Sonoran Desert Museum west of town here. Have you been there? Great idea. Yeah, of course. I just NASA, I, and they have a little dig area where they do some things and the skeletons on the wall and a fossil cave with the timeline. And it might be a really nice opportunity to see how things are now, how they were layered down before, and then over in the, the petrified forest where that those layers from before are kind of exposed. Just an idea. I don't know if it'll work or not, but <laughs> but it would be cool if it did work. That's a, that's a great idea. Um, yeah. So I think what's so neat, Emily, is that you're so, you're open. You're open to to talking with us educators about you know what's next and how mm -hmm. do we get the petrified forest into into the classroom. As you said, if we can't get there, we'll we'll bring you to us you just did that for us virtually and we appreciate it but i definitely think we need to get up there i know that there's lots of other partnerships like in um the paleo world they have um researchers that come from virginia tech and the smithsonian's coming out yale um we do i know i do all the educational fee waivers so there's numbers of college classes that come here to study our sediments and this rock layer um so that happens as well, a brief tour. Um, 
I know I often think about our in-park hikes, like, am I making this too academic? Should it just be a little more fun and be like, what kind of rocks do we have here? Can you name three rock groups and what kind do we have? And then like, just go and check them out, you know, like, but. <laughs> That's my kind of, that's my kind of learning. That's as my informal kind of or as formal as needed. Like that's what we do here at Petrified Campus. <laughs> that's so fabulous. Well, we cannot thank you enough for taking out, taking your time and sharing with us all the great resources. Um, I know that there are others on the call that may have some resources that they want to share as well. I know a few of us had to take off. I will share, um, I, I just shared the fact that we were looking for teachers. So make sure that to, to get up there to, to the Petrified Forest in March. So um, we'll get you that information as soon, as soon as we can. And I saw Manny, you're right. Let's give her a round of applause. Thank you, Emily. Wow, we appreciate you. My, my, I'm the loudest clapper. It might just be because y'all are muted, but I'm the loudest. <laughs> I'm just, I am so excited. I, this there's been so much information shared from both of you here that I had no clue about no clue and um, I will be sure to share that amongst my networks. Go yeah. ahead. And Emily, I know that you were saying you thought that he had a fabulous presentation, which I missed, but um, I want to say your presentation was very nice. It was comprehensive enough to give me a good idea of resources that you have and what is available there. So good job. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, the I know the paleo guys are always happy to talk to people and um, set stuff up. Um, I'm have a upcoming meeting with those in the demo lab, the paleontologists fossil preparers to talk about more how to do it virtually, a virtual visit to a lab. And I do know, I just remembered on our YouTube channel, they have created some videos about how fossils are brought in from the field about how making the jackets or just their work as paleontologists. Um, so there's some of that on our YouTube channel. Yeah, you said YouTube um, channel. I see Marnie, she's going for it. She's yeah, gonna I know. Thank you, Marnie. Get the chat <laughs> as soon as possible. Um, and then there was a question from Cal. Uh, do we still have our traveling trunks? Um, we have all the resources from our traveling trunks, but we, I do not send them because they weigh a ton and that costs a lot of money. Um, and I'm not sure how valuable those are, but we still have them. I still have access to parts of them. Um, so, and for um, those new educators that will be watching this uh, show, what are the traveling trunks? Traveling trunks. I'm not sure what decade the traveling trunks started in, but you would get this huge tub of books, supplies, lesson plans um, to do cool things about geology. Uh, I know there was some Native American things, I think in some of ours about animals, wildlife. So I think if you check out the um, Eric's resources, it would be like that, only you would get it in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> the 90s. And then you would have to return it. So um, yeah, definitely Emily. what I did when I was in elementary school, I'm not sure it's relevant today. Oh, so. Car Carol, Carol got one in the 90s when she was teaching. Oh, okay. This is so, exciting. So we, if you would like it, I'm happy to send you things. <laughs> but. Yeah, I think I did. I think I did some trunks from Game and Fish back there, Josh. Yeah, so we, we have what we call our bone boxes as well. We kind of put them on hold during COVID, especially in the beginning when we didn't know whether you could touch things and, and all kinds of stuff. Um, they are not currently on our website because again, we're, we're trying to feel, we're kind of in the same situation, Emily. We didn't, we never mailed them out, but we have, you know, six offices around the state and we, we've tried to distribute them around. We've actually partnered with some other organizations like Audubon and some of the county parks to put our boxes in those locations as well. But the teachers do have to come and get them um, from those locations just because they are, they're a huge box. They would cost 200 to $300 to ship them and, and that just yeah. fills the budget when you could be using that for other resources but we you won't find them on our website but I do I still have them as well so if somebody really wanted our bone boxes which is going to be focused on native wildlife we're not going to have the cultural stuff that you have in yours um, but they could certainly drop me an email and I could probably make arrangements to getting those until I figure out what the future of our bone boxes is going to be as well. And ours were created 30 years ago as well. And I've done a couple updates since I've been here. I kind of aligned them to new standards and pulled out like the VHS videotapes and, and replaced them with things like that. But 
but um they're still they're, they're, they're a cool resource but they're incredibly difficult to manage and um mm -hmm. some other logistics things that come with them so yeah the data i think what got our to me is ours were very dated the material in it we don't use some of the words or phrases anymore either so <laughs> <laughs> that can be a problem that can be problematic i think yeah that's important to get that part right yeah, oh, goodness. yeah. Well, what I don't know, because I never got a traveling trunk, so I, I guess I feel somewhat out of the loop, but I, I love that it's still available if you if you would like that, because sometimes in rural uh, areas, you know, you can do that, you can do a lot more than not not say you wouldn't in a, in a city area, but we've got the Arizona Science Center right next door, so it's it's a little easier. Well, well, I want to say thank you to everyone. Um, if we have more questions, we definitely I, I've got a little bit more time, but I figured I would go ahead and pop into the chat that next uh, in the next couple of weeks, August 31st, uh, join us for our topic, Arizona Zoos and Museums. Register um, there at our Canyon P PD website. And I, and I want to just say a huge thank you to Canyon PD for J Grand Canyon University just to sponsor uh, these STEM talks. Mm -hmm. This is our STEM leadership cadre showcase series and it's not just grand canyon uh, cal and joe rosell and manny and bill and and hopefully any any of you who want to be a part of the leadership role we'd love for you to uh you know just connect with one of those persons that i talked about and be a part of our solution we want to be the solution to the problem of how do we get our resources our very rich stem resources out into the classroom we find a great way to do that is to connect with our teachers our stem directors and individuals who are interested in really pushing the boundaries of stem education so with that said um you're going to find everything you need at our canyon pd website um in, in addition to some professional learning and stem and STEAM as well. So, uh, Marnie, anything else? Cece, anything else? Uh, Manny, Mesa, do you want to talk about anything from Mesa's perspective? We got a couple of things going on there too. This is all really great. I can't wait to share um, a lot of these resources, you know, with our Mesa advisors um, for sure. Um, we do have our kickoff this Saturday uh, to to discuss Mesa. If you know teachers that are, might be interested, um, they can reach out to me. Um, I'll put my email in the chat. Um, and it's a it's a great way just to learn a little bit about Mesa and see if the students are interested if you're out, the schools might be interested in being part of a program. Yeah, we, and and we partner with Mesa. Mesa's so so darn fabulous. The uh, individuals that really we want to affect there are the underrepresented students. So if you if anybody on the call really is working with those students with those types of students, especially in rural Arizona, Eric, Emily. When you when you meet teachers that you know mm -hmm. have those underrepresented students and, and this is such an incredible stem I, I don't even want to call it a program i want to call it a mindset uh it's a wonderful mindset and i think more students especially in rural arizona need uh mesa so let manny know or you can contact any of us uh you know marnie myself as well thanks again we'll see you on the 31st for arizona zoos and museums take care everybody Bye bye